Hi oh guys, uh, hope you're keeping well. Still in lockdown over here. Um, you know, but it's okay. You know, we're getting used to it. Uh, I've been doing uh, a bit more work on the uh, Robbie Laser uh, Mosquito with the laser engine. Um, I found out something, well, I've been finding out a lot about this sort of setup of this laser engine. And I know I was a bit sceptical, I think, on the last video about a laser engine because it's not one of my favourite engines. Uh, it always lacked a little bit of power and it's heavy. Well, I've been sort of, I took the engine out and I still didn't really um, sort of twig it or see, you know, I took the engine and um, out the helicopter, I stripped the helicopter down, you know, I've got all these parts here, I'll show you a bit later. But as I'm taking the engine out, I sort of, I looked at the top of the rocker box, and uh, what does it say on there? I'll just try and get that in focus. It says laser heli. So a laser actually made a helicopter engine. Now I've never heard of this and this I don't know anyone who actually knew that laser made a helicopter engine it must it's you're going back sort of over 20 years ago um, and I've been on their new website and uh, it's not sort of listed there but um anyway so it gives me a little bit more hope <laughs> that this is actually made for a helicopter but this engine is not in uh, the best of health, really. It's not. Um, I haven't got the piston here because it's got to go away. The the piston's got a crack in the bottom of the skirt. I don't know whether that was caused by over revving or heat. You know, it seized. The bore itself has got you know quite a few. There's quite a few lines in it, and there's also a little nick. I don't know if you can see it, just there where my finger is. There's a little nick there. I don't know how that's got in there. But it's actually got a little crack in it as well. But there is a few little marks in there. And I believe the chrome may be coming off as well. Now, I've been on to laser uh, this morning. And I actually said I should better get a new piston okay. So it's a piston with two rings. So... That's what I've got to get. It's kind of wasted away in the centre. Uh, and it looks like it's seized on the bottom of the skirt and it sort of pulled it away. I can't see any other damage, but there is a line around. I don't know if you can see it in there. Right at the bottom there, there's an actual line that's that's going around the, the bore. And that actually, I think, has seized up on that. But anyway, hopefully I can get a new piston. Whether I've got to get a new, you know... A new one of these, I don't know, because they're chrome. They're chrome on the uh, on the alley. So unless it's a steel, I think it's all kind of one piece. But but there you go. So anyway, obviously I've given this engine a good clean up because it was in such a state. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know why people do this. Uh, it had no gaskets on it. It had kind of a couple of screws missing. A uh, couple of odd screws in it, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, I don't know why people can't sort of buy the right screws for it or, or, you know. And the guy who must have built this helicopter years ago, um, it didn't have any gaskets on it. So all the oil has been coming out everywhere um, and the exhaust. I mean, this is what we had for the exhaust. Now, look, obviously... You know, I've got to do something with that. This goes round and out of the back, but it's held him with like two screws, you know. I, I think I can actually drill and tap that and make a proper screw in insert. Uh, but the things with um, four-stroke engines, they do run very, very hot, um, you know, and it does destroy a lot of stuff. And the, the thing is, because they run so hot, as soon as the fuel leaks out of them, you know, be it exhaust or engine or wherever it comes from, it bakes onto it, and it's so hard to get off. I mean, I've, t I've been most of the day, really, cleaning this engine up. You know, I use a little bit of, um, like, Hobbright. It's uh, very, you know, it's very slightly abrasive. It's not It's not strong. It's just like a... Um, you use a toothbrush, something like that, 
a little bit of washing up liquid and a little bit of hob bright, anything like that, a slight abrasive in it, and you can just clean it up and make it look like the factory finish. You know, I've seen a lot of guys polish them up and wire brush them, but you don't want that. You want it to look like it did in the first place, which is kind of like just the silver. So, you know, I'm sort of happy the way it's cleaned up, but the few issues we've got with this is like, where are we? This, this hole here, um, it had an odd screw in it. If you can see that one, that one there is a bigger hole than the rest of them. And when I looked into uh, the crankcase here, this, uh, sorry, wrong end. This crankcase here, the, the hole here is kind of the threads like non-existent in there. So I'm going to have to have a look and see what I can do with that. I've ordered new screws because, you know, being a British made engine back in the day, they're all made out of, um, they've all got um, imperial screws in them. So laser in their wisdom, excuse me, decided to make the screws 4BA. And I think most of them are like 4BA. So I've actually ordered the screws because these had like, um, they should be cap heads, but they had like these cross head screws in there with great big um, like spring washers. And the amount of Loctite, well, I, I think, you know, it was so much Loctite in there, it was incredible. Um, it was actually inside the engine. So whether that's sort of caused it to seize back in the day or whether it's got too hot or... You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've might tuck, measured all the crank and everything. You know, it's all good size, the crank. I mean, I've cleaned them up with a little bit of scotch bright. You know, the um, the scouring pad type thing. Try not to use a wire brush and all that. Um, if you clean these up very sort of carefully, you know, I've seen guys with a wire brush and stuff like that. And you just, you know, you just got this a sort of delicate engine and just be careful now. These are the little, this is one of the cams. It's, I mean, it's quite a lumpy cam there. I have asked Laser, they didn't get back to me today, but I, I did say to them, have they done anything different to um, the helicopter and to give it more power? You know, like with some of my um, OS4 strokes, the 26, they changed the cam and springs and valves. And I just wonder whether laser did into this to get more power out of them. But I wouldn't have thought so, but you don't know. These are the little the little cam followers that, that run on it. Uh, we've got the push rods and the tubes. You know, they've all cleaned up nice. They're going to be all right. I've got to get some uh, O-rings because they're all worn and uh, they've gone like, really hard, so they're no good. Now, the carburetor on these is quite interesting. I mean, the early ones, it's my heater coming on again. Uh, the early ones, um, laser engines. I mean, laser engines, I think the first one was fired up back in 83. So they've been going since then, you know. And the early laser engines had a super tight carburetor. And where it went on, they used grub screws to hold it on. Now, it's not a great idea because people do them up so tight that it, it marks the... Uh, the manifold where it screws on and it makes a hell of a mess of it, you know. Uh, on their later engines, I think it was from about 91, 92, they used like a little clamp. If you can see this little clamp that clamps onto the head, it's a much better idea. And they also went over to the Irving carburetor. Now this is an Irving carb. Uh, it's just been like anodized purple. I, I don't know why. I mean, I have got um, a couple of... Um, Irving carburetors. Now this is the Jetstream carburetor, which is a really good carburetor. I've taken it all apart. It was all gummed up and the jets and everything. So I've cleaned it all out. I'll give it another blast tomorrow. I'll put airline through it. You know, you've got to get everything dead clean on, on that. Um, this is the, the barrel uh, out of it. Still needs a bit more cleaning. But again, there was loads of Loctite on the grub screws and stuff like that, you know. I mean, it was actually inside the engine. So where this back plate, because if you look in the back of there, that's where the two cams go. So you've got the drive comes through the middle. So if I just put that in loosely, because I haven't got the bearing in there. Now, this camshaft, right. Right, that's 
that's the cam drive. Now that comes off the crankshaft. It's a bit like a pull start, you know, on the engine. So the crank actually goes in that little U-shape part there. You can see that? So that little U-shape, the crank pin goes in there and it spins that round. And then you've got this gear on here. And each side, you've got a cam. Now, those cams have got no timing marks on them. Um, I've... I've done one. I've done a couple of these before, so I know how to time them up. Uh, it's on the net. It's not difficult, um, but I do know how to time them up. But you think they could have put a couple of marks, marks on the, uh, you know, the cams uh, and that dry pin. I mean, OS do it. They put a little line on it, and you line it up with a push rod. You know, it's easy, easy to do. This one, it's, once you know how to do it, it's, it's no big deal. You know, um, you identify these by the numbers engraved on here and i've been told that the early ones went with our registration of cars like back in the day we had a b c d e f g uh, all the way through and that was a registration number and what laser did whatever year the car was and they made the engine they stamped like m on there i can't i don't know what the m stands what year that is i can't think of it at the moment but it's got on there mf9 and then it's I mean, where it's been loose on the engine mount, it's kind of like it's vibrated and made a mark on there, so I can't see. But it looks like it's got FH, I think that is, FH9, and it's got an N. But obviously, I'm missing the middle. Sometimes I used to put the customer's, they just stamped the name on it of the customer. Um, lots of things they did, because they don't even put the size of the engine on. So when I bought it, I did not know you know, with the helicopter, what size the engine is. But apparently all uh, laser helicopter engines, which is very few and far between, I've only found one other guy with them. And if you actually go on the net and you type in like a laser helicopter engine, you can't find one. It's like, you know, something that's never been made. I, I couldn't believe it. When I saw that rocket box with heli on it, I thought, oh, well, I'm bound to find some of them on the net, but I haven't. So it's got to be a really sort of rare engine. So... The engine's kind of cleaned up. Hopefully I can get a piston and uh, rings for it. I'm not sure what to do about the bore. I'll ask them tomorrow because I emailed them this morning uh, and, and they got back to me straight away and asked me to send some pictures of the piston, which I have, um, but they haven't come back to me. So maybe tomorrow I'll, I'll give them another email and, and see what they come up with. And while we're talking about engines here, this, this, these are the bearings out of the engine now obviously you can see the kind of they're red rusty uh you can't you can't put these back in the engine you know that's the front one's got a seal on it uh this is the one that actually holds the camshaft so it comes through there and the cam runs through there onto the gears obviously red rusty again um you can't put them in now the rust it's caused by the nitro in the fuel. Now, this this is what happens. I, I've lost count of how many engines that I've actually stripped down. Even if the guy says, oh, it's only been run once or, you know, it's only been run in and, you know, you if you buy a second-hand engine, you're more or less guaranteed that you've got to change those bearings. Now, with a four-stroke, it's not so critical as with a two-stroke. Now, if you get a two-stroke ABC engine, the piston and liner on the top of them, they've got a tapered sleeve, tapered liner, and it relies on the like precision fit of the piston at top dead centre. It's got to be like it's a really tight fit in there, and that's how you get the power, because there's no friction apart from when it just nips up at the top and it fires. Now, as soon as you lose that seal up there, the piston and liner is no good. It's toast. It's finished. Now... They're very expensive, and if you was to get an engine off eBay, the guy says, oh, excellent compression, blah, 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 and you used to start that just for five minutes with rusty bearings in it, you would kill that engine. And that would be because the particles, the particles off these bearings, what it is, they're chromed. The balls are chromed, and the chrome comes off. When they go rusty, the chrome comes off the bearings, and all the rusty particles, and they go up into the bore of a two-stroke, and it grinds up and down with a piston, and it destroys that precision fit at the top. So, you know, whenever you buy a second-hand engine, 
or any engine really that's you know been used it don't take five minutes to change these bearings you know you can buy a new set of bearings you just warm the casing up they just drop in it's easy to do you know don't be scared of it don't use a hammer and what i've you know i've seen people use hammer and presses and god knows what else all you need to do is just warm the outside of the casing up and they just fall out and when you want to put them back in you just warm up the crankcase again i normally put the crank through there drop it in and push the front one on to the crank and it's done let it cool down and sit no bashing with a mallet or chisels or anything like that it's as easy as that a really easy job to do now on the four stroke it's not so critical um you still need to change them because it's no good with bits of chrome laying around but because it don't push the fuel up to the top of the bore um you know it's not so bad uh but you still really need to replace them. I mean, I've seen guys on YouTube, which I cannot believe, when they've gone, oh, yeah, well, I brushed them and then put them back. Can you, I can't, I just can't believe that. You just cannot do that. You you know, you've got to buy new ones. And what causes this rust is if you lay the engine up for some time. The best way to stop this or to slow it down, because I don't think you can ever stop it. You know, I've been dealing with nitro engines for so long now, and I've replaced so many of these bearings, and... You might be able to slow it down, but you can't actually stop it. You know, mate, if you run on straight fuel without, um, you know, nitro in it, it might help and stuff like that. But I think it's something to do with the actual combustion process as well, you know. So the best way is to, like, after you finish your flying or whatever, is to drain the fuel out and then just keep trying to start the engine to burn the fuel out of the engine. So... Let it fire up, drain the tank out until it won't start again. Put the starter on it and it'll fire for a little while. Keep doing it until it stops firing so there's no fuel left in the engine. And then if you can, try and get some after run oil in it straight away because that will help slow down the engine. So, you know, obviously this one's been there for like 20 years in the after running and you can see what's happened to the bearings. But I've got them all on order, so they're here soon. So that's the main part of the engine sort of okay i've managed to clean up this exhaust uh, it's very heavy kind of thing i don't know what i'm what i'm going to put a lighter one on because it's a very heavy helicopter very heavy um okay now i think you saw in the last video um this canopy here uh, let's just put this up a little bit this this canopy um it got damaged in the post um you know the guy packed it uh, I think I said to you, um, he gave me a refund for it. I mean, actually, he gave me the complete price back of what Apache paid for the helicopter. But um, I've managed to sort of get it all back together. Uh, it's fairly strong. It was probably three or four days' work. Um, a filler and glue and God knows what else. And what I've got to do, I've managed to use... I've used some light epoxy resin uh, and I use the, you know, the uh, aluminium mesh. So where it was really bad, these are the two holes of bolts on. Um, and this bit wasn't even here. This this part here wasn't even there. Uh, and it had cracked right through this windscreen all the way down there and out down there. Um, and I actually had it kind of almost repaired and I went and dropped it <laughs> right on the nose. And it put another big crack that went right up over there. And just about see it right up over there. So I wasn't best pleased. So I left it for a day before I stamped on it. And uh, I went back to it the next day. Um, and I managed to sort of glue all the glass. I mean, it's a shame I've had to kind of glue all that inside. But um, it's fairly strong. Uh, obviously, I'm, gonna, I'm still going to... Uh, rub some of this down um, you know clean it all up inside get you know most of the glue off but what I've um, also got a little piece there I've got a sort out and I've got a couple of little digs there and this is still quite rough at the moment because it's only like a plastic and what I actually did I did it with sort of um, I filled it because it was all cracked here um, I filled it um, but before I filled it I rubbed it down with um, some, I think it was 
120 grey sort of uh, sandpaper. So it was quite quite rough. But I thought that's going to take the paint a lot better, this undercoat. It's going to take the paint, um, you know, it's going to stick to it well. Otherwise, if you put it on a, a smooth plastic like I've done with the windows here, I thought it might sort of flake off. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sand all this down smooth. I've still got a bit of filler to put in here and there because another thing I did wrong, um, I tried to put a bit of heat on it to get the decals off and end up deforming the, the canopy here. I think that was on the same day as I dropped it, so that wasn't a good day. But it's not looking too bad at the moment, so I need a bit of filler here and there, and then I'm going to finish this off with some 600 wet and dry, just get it smooth I can. I'm going to mask the windows up and I'm going to paint it spray it probably going to be white and then i bought some uh, vinyl wrap um, and i'm going to try and do the glass in a vinyl wrap so that's you know my windows will be gloss black should be a white piece coming down there and i will put a black you know a trim around there to make it look nice and neat and i will make up my own decals you know what it had on the side of the r22 on the side and uh, you know it might look alright. I still haven't touched the uh, towel broom yet because, like I said to you, that's got like a lemonade bottle on the end of it, which is going to be quite uh, a challenge to sort out. But um, the other thing I was, uh, I think on the last video I said to you now, the four strokes, um, they don't rev. I don't know what the the revs of this uh, laser is, but it won't rev like a two stroke. Now these mosquitoes, I think they had in like um, a 50 size engine. I think it was a 46 to a 50. Now, a four stroke engine will only rev kind of, what I say, half of, of like a two stroke. So you normally have to gear everything up. Um, and while I was on the net, I was searching and searching and I'm on a, 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 an old Morley helicopter forum. And a guy on there actually had one of these laser engines, heli engines. He's the only guy I've seen with one and the only other engine I've seen. And when he showed me the clutch belt, it's in a mosquito as well, but on a different body shell. He had a, quite a large clutch belt on it. And I thought, well, that's the way I've got to do it. But I got on to my, I've got a guy on eBay, um, Eddie, who gets me lots of bits and pieces for my helicopters and all the old bits and pieces like that. And I had a word with him. Um, and he said to me, he thinks that they run the standard gearing because it was a helicopter from, say, 20 years ago. And he can remember it. And he said, I'm sure they just run maybe a different clutch, but they ran the standard gearing. Now, I, I couldn't see that. And he said, the guy I used to sort of do the conversion or involved in it was Trevor at Midland Helicopters. So he said, give him a ring and see if you can, you know, get any more info of him. So... This morning, I, I, I gave him a ring and uh, he said, yeah, we sort of uh, did the conversion um, probably 20, 21 years ago. And they did run the standard gearing. And he said it gave it a really nice, uh, realistic kind of head speed. And I think he said, I can't remember now, if they run semi-symmetrical blades on it to give it a bit more lift or something like that. Um, obviously, it's going to be kind of marginal on power, but I've got a lot of helis that are like that um but he said it it did actually fly quite well the setup did work out quite well i think all you've got to do is take three millimeter off the um they've got a lot of cooling ducts uh, there it is again it's made out of stainless steel weighs a ton i'm going to make one out of a bit of alley because it's just so heavy i think this is the bit you cut away because it looks like it's been hacked away uh you know the guy didn't have a Dremel or anything who did this. There's a lot of bits like that on the heli, but you just have to take a little bit off of that to get the engine to fit. Now, I still, <laughs> I'm still, i so sceptical. I can't believe that an engine with sort of almost half the revs is going to actually lift this helicopter off the ground. But, uh, you know, Trevor said it does. So if I can get this engine running okay uh, with a new piston in it, uh maybe it will uh, you know and it will be nice if it's a good you know head speed because 
like I say on it, there's a lot of bits that are quite worn on it, as though it's had a lot of flying. Um, I've actually ordered a metal fan for it. Uh, it's a much more sculptured kind of fan. Um, because, you know, four strokes do run really hot. Um, so I've ordered um, uh, a metal fan. Uh, and I've got the alloy um, pinion coming. Because, I don't know if you can see, this one... The teeth are like razor blades. It's really worn. So, you know, it, that's what my friend was saying to me. He goes, if you look at the pinion on that, it's really worn. So it's obviously has flown. You know, this is before I knew that it was a proper helicopter engine. And I just thought, well, it can't, you know, it just cannot fly like that. But, it, you know, <laughs> Trevor done the, you know, the conversion and said it flies okay. So, you know, you don't argue with that man. So... I think, you know, I might be lucky, it may fly, but as you can see, that is so worn. Um, I've ordered uh, the alley one. Uh, I had fun and games getting this all apart, I can tell you. I mean, you can still see the locks art on the inside there. It was just chocker. You've got like, um, they've got a really strange one-way sort of bearing in it. It's, it's like a ratchet type thing. Um, it, it's a very... You know, when you look at these old helicopters, uh, today's stuff, you think, why did they make stuff so complicated? You know, all we got now is a one-way bearing. It works fine, and it's so simple, it's half the weight. If you look at these old helicopters, I mean, this has got a ratchet. I don't think I've got it in my box of tricks here. It's actually got a ratchet with two little springs, you know, that go on it. And, uh, oh, God, uh, it's such a complicated... A setup like you wouldn't wouldn't believe. Um, I've got some parts of it here. I don't know if I've actually got the ratchet. What I've been working on. Oh, here it is. Right. Right here it is. Now, this is a one-way bearing or the free wheeling. Whereas nowadays, all we have. I'll get that in focus. All we have nowadays is like a one-way bearing, isn't it, on the main shaft, you know, and the gear. But if you can see, that's got two spring-loaded plungers that run on that. So it grips one way, and when it goes the other way, it free wheels. So when it's driving, it grips on these parts here, and when it stops driving, it free wheels around there, and it goes tick, 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 tick. You can hear it kind of clicking. Well, that was put on with, like... I don't know, it must have been about half a bottle of Loctite. And this, this part here, I've got a new one of these coming. This part here, what holds the clutch, take, took me hours to get apart because it went in there, or it goes in there like that, um, and the shaft goes through it, and it goes on the end of the engine. Now, it had been Loctite on it, you know, Loctite on the end of the engine, and it was absolutely solid. And there's a little piece that goes in there, very thin walls that goes in there. And also, that had been locked tight as well. And I didn't want to put too much heat on it because I didn't want to ruin this clutch. You, you know, you can't put heat on that. That's like hard and tempered steel to be springy. And if you put any heat on that, it's going to, like, you're going to lose a spring on it. And that, that took me, oh, so long to get that off. Um, you know, trying to be careful with it. Uh, but... I'm not happy with this part, uh, you know, it's been knocked about a lot and whatever, so when I was on the Midland site this morning, they had a few bits on there, and they were doing this whole setup with the, not with the clutch, but with the, um, the ratchet, one way, and they were doing this part and a few other bits or something, and it's reduced from like 50 quid or something down to 19, so... It was a no-brainer to buy it, you know. So that's what I've done. I've, I've bought that part for it. This is the the other part that goes in the end of the um, main shaft. That bit looks okay. Just need a bit more cleaning up. These are the little springs and the little plungers that go on the ratchet. That drive. These little pins actually drive the rotors round. <laughs> I know. And the other thing, which is quite nice on it, it's got a lovely swash plate. 
Now, I saw this on Midland's site this morning, and it was like 75 quid's worth or something. So, if someone spent some money on on this, I'll just give it a clean up and a WD-40. Um, the other thing I'll kind of make me laugh, really, is, again, this is like, this is a feathering shard for this helicopter. Now, these days, we have the blade grips, we have two bearings, and we have a thrust race at each end. I think that's normal. Um, but not with this one. We've got these two great big metal collars, if you want to call them that, and these screw into the blade grips. So these are actually hold the blade grips. Now, the blade grips themselves have got... Again, I'm not prepared because I can't find them. Um, oh, I don't know what I've done with them. I've probably left them up in my room. Oh, here we go. Now, I don't know if you can see that on the blade grips, but they've got little markings on them. Right on here, like it's degrees. I've got them on both sides. You can just see them there. Now this bit actually goes in there and you've got them little screws. And that's what stops these from flying off. It's those, I should imagine, they're 2.5 screws. So that's a bit scary, but there you go. Apparently it worked. So who am I to, uh, you know, judge it but here we go we've got like the thrust bearing on the end there this has all got to be cleaned up thrust bearing and we've got one ball race so we've got one ball race there and then we've got this collar what holds the blade grip on and then we've got a, a thrust race you know and that looks like six mil diameter again over engineered like the rest of the helicopter uh what have we got this is a very kind of strange set up here. I haven't got the the bottom of it. But this is like a sandwich. So the engine kind of it's been cut out here for the laser engine. I'm gonna trim that up. It's been sort of hacked out with a Stanley knife or something. But I'm gonna trim that up because it's not in bad condition. Plus like on here that's where the exhaust has been melting it. Um you got I'm gonna trim that away. And there's a few other bits that need a tremor on it. But you know it's cleaned up. It's very strong. But I've never seen, this is kind of the top half of the sandwich and there's another piece that sort of goes under here and it clamps down together and the engine goes up in here. Now, uh, I'm thinking, I believe, if I can find the engine mounts, uh, here we go. Now these are the engine mounts, again plastic. Not my favourite kind of thing, especially when the engines get so hot, so... I'm probably going to make myself a set of alloy engine mounts uh, to go onto the laser. Um, these are kind of, they're a bit squashed and, you know, they're kind of hollow. And I'll see if I can make up some nice, uh, I'll buy some alley. I might even have some actually. Uh, and I'll make them like a nice alley. It'll take the heat away a bit, um, you know, and be more secure for the engine. Uh, I've already bought this. This fan, uh, not fan, this uh, shroud. So I've managed to get a, well, fairly good condition one of these because the other one, I think what it is, you've got a cone that comes through there. And if you slip with a starter, it's very easy to mash this part around here. Um, you know, I noticed a guy had a bolt in the middle. Um, so maybe he was using to start off, you know, like a hexagon drive or something like that. I might put on... Um, like a hex drive in the centre as well. So it still looks like it's got a cone on it, but you style it with my line starter and I can put that on the end of that. I think it's a seven by one thread. So it, it's kind of a standard thread on there. And I, I may be able to uh, make a hex, um, you know, female hexagon on there to drive it. Cause it'd be much easier to start out because I could imagine slipping with a starter and smashing that, that through there. This is the other part of it, so, you know, the others were really, they were painted and they were in the right state, so I've got the fan cover. Uh, the main gear is in quite a good condition. 
you know, I can't see anything really wrong with that. It dries on a square. Um, I was going to say to you, you know, they've got three mil diameter push rods. They're massive, you know. I've never seen a helicopter or anything like that. And everything you pick up, you can feel the way. And obviously now the canopy, it's, yeah, we must have like a, a pack of, or two bottles of um, uh, epoxy resin in that. You know, and a, a bottle of cyano and uh, epoxy resin. So there's quite a lot of weight in that canopy, to be honest with you. But, you know, you never, I'm hoping it's going to fly. These are the the drive gears. Uh, this one drives a tail, I believe. Uh, it's kind of like that. Uh, and it goes through. It's like a shaft goes through there. It goes down each side and there's a little gear or pulley in there for the tail. Quite a fine tooth pitched uh, belt for the tail. Um, now this is the the throttle linkage. Now this throttle linkage obviously there's a couple of bits of carbon on there and there's one at the top so this must be part of you know the retrofit of the uh, of the laser four stroke. You know it all seemed to work okay so I'm not going to mess about with it. It's a bit of carbon might trim it up a little bit. A couple of bearings in it uh it all works okay so i'm not going to change that i'm sure that's going to be okay obviously i've got rid of this i've got a new fan coming a proper metal fan with us you know with the curves on it so that should work 100 percent better than that thing uh that's the the heads with the damper rubbers in they don't look too bad uh, again Two tons of Loctite for the head button, which I'll need to get off. Um, what else have we got? Oh, I'll tell you one thing I like. Now, this, these are some of the links on the heli. Now, if you look at those little metal links, what my finger's pointing at now, they've got a lovely colour to them. They're almost like a gun blue. They're, they're kind of a nice colour. Really beautiful finish, you know. Not all anodized or whatever, just a lovely finish on there. It's a, it's a good quality machine, you know, just like I said, it's over engineered, but that's what they did back in the days. Oh, yeah, this is the um, this is what the uh, like I just showed you just now, what the uh, belt tail drive runs in. So you've got a bearing each side and a tooth pulley there, and the belt goes through there. So, really, kind of that's about it. I've, oh, I've got. Some of the electrics here. Let's put some of this away before I lose it. Because obviously, very hard to get hold of bits. Um, Trevor at Midlands has actually got a set of landing gear for me. So that's going to be nice. Because at the moment, it's got some homemade... Um, I don't know what they are. They're massive lumps of alley and tape. And uh, I just want to throw them away. Uh, you know, horrendous... Um, skids on them. Now, I've seen the original ones and they're just like two little lightweight um, feet coming down and some the skids ain't look like about 8 mil diameter or something like that so I've got a set of those coming these are the electronics out of it now I don't know we've got a mixture of servos in here uh, these these were always in helicopters. These were the uh, Samwas, the Nest 517s. Uh, they're reliable. They were a reliable helicopter. You know, it was a slow analog servo, nothing great, but they always seem to come in early helicopters. Uh, uh, the old trusty Futaba 3001, follow up to the 148. Whether they will work or not, I don't know. I'll have to test them. Now, this is a different one. This is a a Robbie, a Robbie Futaba 3001. So, obviously, they must have worked hand in hand. You know, Robbie and Futaba. It's, how these, it's like with Kyosho and everything. It was Kraft, wasn't it? Um, Gruppner and they, they all got sort of uh, mixed up together. Although you still get Gruppner and stuff like that and Robbie, it, it, you know, other companies came out of it like Futaba. Now, there's another one. Uh, that's got JR. 
But I mean, really, it's like a Samoir Ness L501. Don't know what that is. I'll look it up and see what the speed is of that. Um, and what's this one? Another J, another JR basic sort of servo from back in the day, 507. Uh, and, of course, we have the original Futaba mechanical gyro. Probably this on top here is a voltage checker, a very crude one. Uh, let's peel that off. Um, yeah. I mean, I used to fly on one in the back of the day on these, and they were fine. You know, you had to remember to switch it on. <laughs> so you had to switch your helicopter on and then switch your gyro on. And then, woof, off it went. Um, and, you know, we've got the gain and stuff on there. And to be honest with you, you know, they work quite well. Uh, but it's, a, you know, another heavy lump that I've got to get rid of. So if I can get rid of that, and, you know, this and the shroud and a few other little bits... I mean, there were some bits on the fly bar. Uh, there's some brass bits. Can you believe there's brass bits on the heli? Just see if I'll... They might be on the fly bar. I've actually straightened the fly bar. Uh, and the fly bar looks like it's a homemade one, so uh, I don't think it's going to be uh, that good, really, because it's straightened really easy. No, I haven't got the... Um, I haven't got the brass bits down there, but they go on the, on the fly bar. And they're probably about 12 millimetre brass. Whether they're for some sort of weight or something like that, I, I don't know. But, you know, to me, uh, I reckon I might make some out of Ali. Just just try and trim the weight down of this helicopter because, I mean, I've added so much with that canopy. And no doubt when I do the towel as well, um, because I, I don't know what I'm going to do with that towel. Um, you know, it's it's been broken and someone's glued a lemonade bottle on the end of it and I don't want to start filling it. I mean, I mean I, I'm wondering whether I can make a complete new one because it's only like a straight pipe, uh, well, a tapered pipe, uh, whether I could use any kind of plumbing thing, anything like that. And Because I've got some glue that I do, you know, the ABS glue it okay and, you know, whatever. But anyway, I suppose i better wrap this one up. Um... I've still not done much more work on the Aprilia. I'm waiting for a front wheel. I've all, I've got a front wheel for it, but it's got the wrong speed I drive. Uh, and I'm waiting for the guy to send me another wheel. Uh, he said he's got some in his warehouse, but he can't find them. So I've got to send the other one back. Blah, blah, blah. Um, the Toyon twin cylinder truck is almost ready to go. Uh, I started making an exhaust for it last week. I've actually... I've made an exhaust for it, but I don't like it. So I'm going to scrap it uh, and start again. So I'm not going to show you guys the, uh, the one I'm scrapping because it's not it's not me. I was kind of being lazy. I bent it up and I sort of stuck them out of the side and I thought, after I made them, I thought, no, I don't like it. So I'm going to start again on them. I've ordered some more alley again. Um, I found some thick wall alley, it bends quite nice if you heat it up, so I'm going to try and make two pipes come out the back. Maybe not like the, um, the, the, the clone uh, blazer, but uh, like two pipes close together out of one side, that's one thing you're doing. But I can't have this pipe all the way down because this thick wall pipe, it's okay, but it's it going to be quite restrictive. And the longer you have it, it be more restrictive, so I'm going to make the down pipes out of it. Then I'm going to make bigger diameter pipes to come out the back, uh, so to give it a bit, you know, freer running. So that's where I am with my projects at the moment. Um, you know, we're making progress. I kind of do a bit on one, get fed up with it, and I go back to the other one, and then I go back. You know, I mean, I'm sort of got a bit more hope with this now, having a heli engine, and knowing I can get some parts for the engine and stuff like that. I hope they get back to me tomorrow. The canopy was a massive job to try and do. Uh, basically, you know, with a bit of rubbing down and more filler, that should look... I mean, it's not going to look like a new one, uh, but in the air, I think it's going to look nice. Um, you know, the tail boom again is going to be a really uh, awkward job to do. But, you know, I don't mind, um, you know, it's everything's a challenge here. 
Um, you know, I'd get bored. I bought, I've sold most of my modern helicopters. Most of my modern helicopters. You know, all right, you go up, do a few loops, rolls and stuff like that. But they look, I don't know, they're just... I don't know whether it's me or what, but I much prefer... Uh, being a sort of a scaly type modeler, I like things to look like they, you know, should, I think with the 3D type of thing, it's just to sort of prove to yourself you can do it and it's quite good when you're doing it and stuff like that. But I've kind of given up on that. I've got my little 500, which I do loops, rolls and inverted and stuff like that. But, you know, I like to get something like this and bring it back to life. And, you know, I was lucky to get this with this laser helicopter engine because, you know, I think this has got to be one of the most rarest engines around. Uh, you know, you don't see many of these. If you try and find one on the net, let me know because I've not found another one. So I'm going to wind this up now, guys, and uh, I hope to see you in the next one. See you later, guys.